Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Stephen Phillips. I'm the director of the Cal Poly Los Angeles Metropolitan Program in Architecture and Urban Design. Um, we're here again on our lecture series, uh, nearing the end of the academic year for Cal Poly. Um, very excited for our guests this afternoon. Um, just for those who don't know us, uh, we run a program here in Los Angeles off campus about 36 students who are fourth year students from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. They arrive uh, for about 20 weeks. They intern in offices. We uh, teach studio history theory and practice. There are actually about seven other faculty. I see Teddy and uh, Slowick and Pavel Getoff here with us this afternoon uh, among others. And um, yeah, we've been running these series uh, and this event for about 10 years now public events alongside um, our uh, studio that we teach uh, our students with. So just to uh, quickly thank our sponsors, um, HMC Architects, uh, Morphosis, AC Martin, Co-Architects, Theater DNA, Art Group of Graphics, uh, the AIA, uh, Los Angeles and Bulltap who uh, kindly support us as well. Most importantly, Helms Bakery District where we usually run our public events. Uh, Angela is usually with us here today, but she's uh, off. And so I am going to just run this event myself. Anyway, so I'd like to, of course, thank uh, Nader Tarani and Arthur Chang for being with us uh, this afternoon. Um, they are, well, significant on so many levels in the architecture field. And I'm really excited to be able to have them here. Also, particularly Arthur, who's a Cal Poly alum. Um, to uh, join us uh, to talk about their work. Uh, you know, just to be very frank and upfront, um, there are very few architecture firms and architects who've been able to achieve what their office is doing. Uh, this goes without saying, but not only on the architectural level with the extreme production of uh, very accomplished building projects, especially within materiality, texture, and meaning. They also write the Office has produced books, very intellectual and well, high, highly academic books from a long history back. And um, you know, Nadar is of course uh, Dean of Cooper Union. Um, to do all that in one lifetime is rare. There are very few architects that achieve at that level. And so I'm always um, a huge supporter of the effort and the accomplishment because it just, you can count a less than a handful of people who ever achieved that. So. Uh, first and foremost, Nader Tarani, uh, for his contributions to architecture as an art, Nader is the recipient of the 2020 Arnold W. Brummer Memorial Prize from Architectural Academy of Arts and Letters, to which he was also elected as a member in 2021, the highest form of recognition of artistic merit in the United States. Nader Tarani is the founding principal of NADA, N-A-D-A-A-A, and Dean of Cooper Union's Erwin Channon School of Architecture. His research focuses on the transformation of the building industry, innovative material applications, and the development of new means and methods of construction, especially through digital fabrication. And that's really where they began. They were some of the first to start working with digital fabrication and new materials and old materials and showing how the two could be really innovative in our field. Tarani's work has received many prestigious awards including the Cooper Hewitt National Design Merit Award in Architecture, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Architecture Award, and 18 Progressive Architecture Awards. Prior to becoming Dean at Cooper Union, he taught at RISD, Harvard GSD, Georgia Institute of Tech, and MIT. His office, NADA, for the past seven years in a row has ranked among the top design firms in architecture magazine, architect magazine's top 50 firms in the United States, ranking as first three years, as first three years in a row. Arthur Chang, AIA, is principal of NADA. Congratulations, Arthur. He has been a key part of NADA and a collaborator of Nader Tarani's since 2004. This is some serious commitment. Chang's experience in planning and managing all aspects of design projects has led to his work receiving some of the most prestigious national and international awards. Chang has led a variety of institutional and public projects, including the Melbourne School of Design, RISD's Fleet Library, Helios House, 
the Research and Design Center at Beaver Country Day School, a new MTA headhouse in Boston Seaport and North Hall, a new hybrid CLT, Steel Residence Hall for the RISD School of Design, Rhode Island School of Design. Chang holds a Master's of Architecture from University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor's of Architecture from California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo, that's us. He has served as visiting design critic for Harvard University Graduate School of Design, MIT uh, School of Architecture and Planning, Northeastern University, Art and Architecture Department, Rhode Island School of Design, the University of Melbourne, Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning, and the Boston Architectural College. Very excited to have you both here today. I'm really looking forward to, uh, I believe Arthur is going to start us off uh, for the lecture. Um, thank you. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Stephen. This is a real pleasure to be able to, to speak to my alma mater. It's been such a long time since I've been in San Luis Obispo. I think about it every winter around March about why I am on the East Coast. Uh, I think about those days uh, in slow. So um, I hope I'm getting, getting some of that nice West Coast vibes from you right now. Well, let me um, let's see if I can put on the uh the presentation so um today we wanted to just start off a little bit of a conversation about some of the works that we've been doing um through our interest in wood and wood construction and wood technologies you know it's been uh the past 15 so years at nada we've been developing the studio as not just the architecture design space but also fabrication space where we really get to uh, engage in the materials, engage in the means and methods of construction and the mock-ups that really um, speak to the, the actual built environment. So even though we've got 4,000 square feet upstairs, we got 4,000 feet downstairs uh, making uh, in 3D while, while we draw in 2D. So the, our interest in, in wood has been, you know, long, um, been researching through uh, the, the current conditions of the building materials. What, what are these laminar materials, these plywoods, these veneers that, um, that uh, surround us in our environment and how you know, one might be able to reconstruct uh, through different techniques, um, new figures and forms uh, through that material. And it's also in interests of traditional materials and traditional building constructions and how uh, a contemporary uh, attitude can be taken with you know something as simple as a board and batten um, siding that is able to be cut and formed and stretched to become more than just the uh, the seams between two boards. You know, the, the material, uh, of course, not only is um, traditional in its, um, in its ease of, of fabrication, but also in its connection with nature. So whenever uh, a setting calls for um, a material, it's something that uh, also brings of, of interest. And in this case, you know, many times it is all uh, in perhaps about uh, a finish, a skin, it lines a, a space, but also as a, a skin and surface may be able to translate into structure. In this case, uh, the, the faces of a, of a railing become uh, spikes of a railing of, of uh, stanchions themselves. Uh, being able to blur that line between uh, skin and, and structure. This is also pretty evident in some of the earlier works that um, back when uh, the office was called the uh, Office Da, uh, in, in these small scale fabrications where that edge of what is a, a thin material, what is a thick material, what, what is that line in between? You'll see like many of the, the current works, I think looking at the background of some of your, um, of your screens, this is Melbourne University, a project that where a uh, veneer of wood is actually quite uh, a protagonist in the space, really defining that, um, 
uh, that main hall as uh, as a place surrounded by wood, con controlled by by wood, but uh, mostly as a veneer. And what we might not know from uh, the publications of this project is that there was an extensive study that was done investigating the potentials of what uh, cross laminated timber as a structural material, as a decking uh, system to speed up construction um, for this project that may have been uh, two, a two year long construction time, perhaps bringing it down to um, 18 through, through certain material choices. This interest in finding a hybrid condition between a concrete slab and a CLT slab um, being able to thin and unify that that system was was uh, was quite interesting, although ultimately it didn't end up um, being feasible in that project. And we were then, in the past couple of years, uh, lucky enough to be able to engage CLT again um, in a somewhat more conventional sense here at RISD. Although this is the first cross laminated timber hybrid steel frame construction in Rhode Island uh, and, or in New England at that time that, um, you know, at first was quite uh, uh, expensive and a bit scary uh, to, the to the construction team who had never used CLT before. But in, through the investigation and the partnership of our structural engineer, we, we were able to, uh, you know, find ways of, uh, of saving money through speed of construction. Um, these panels are built off-site in 50-foot lengths, uh, prefabricated to fit perfectly with the uh, the steel frame. It was able to be all constructed within um, two weeks uh, for the superstructure once that concrete was was done, um, saving a significant amount of time and offsetting the the cost of uh, of wood over um, the conventional uh, conventional steel construction. So that character of a uh, of timber, you know, although it is was primarily for um, uh, speed of construction and uh, sustainable issues, was able to be exposed and really become part of the character of the building um, through uh, uh, through the influence of both not only our interest in in pushing this natural material exposure, but also um, the partnership of, uh, of RISD themselves. All right, so today um, I wanted to share, I mean, we're pretty excited to share about uh, four, um, four little projects uh, that are still on, on the drawing boards, but all take into consideration what must, uh, cross laminated timber could mean for uh, construction of housing in four different um, contexts. You know, in a rural context where one might find uh, a compact housing condition, unique and different uh, where, where normally you would spread out. Uh, an industrial context of a big box store where uh, considerations of uh, of zoning and and housing can cross over a suburban density uh, proposition, where in an inversion of yards into courtyards um, would bring a new definition of how people might live together in, in a in a density in a suburban context, and finally uh, a, an urban condition where a uh, we stretch the, the limits of low rise uh, housing uh, to the footprint of a, of a very compact row house that is a, you know, most common here in Boston. So um, I'll go through these relatively quickly because I do have a little extra thing at the end that I want to share with you and then we can have our discussions um, after that. So uh, we understand density and compactness, particularly in a, in, uh, in a New England condition where uh, winter times are harsh, summer times are, 
uh, can sometimes be intense as well, but a compact footprint and a tight skin becomes a, uh, a necessity when, when you're building something small out in the countryside. So out here in the Housatonic River, we have this opportunity and this um, question about you know, what does it mean to build a log cabin out in the woods? The log cabin you know, being a, a single room you know, with a, with a toilet, but also a, a, a kitchen and, and places to sleep um, in, in one small, relatively small space. And what might it mean if, if one were to take uh, a log cabin and stack it, stack it on top of itself, being able to create four different conditions, uh, on, one on each level. You know, if, if it all were one unit, how a single person, a family might contain that, um, occupy that, that house. Or as we begin to consider what um, different subdivisions one might have, a different type of living experience when normally you live out in the countryside, you're alone. But here, what if you are are able to to share that condition with a with a broader audience? Is this the the next kind of uh, Airbnb or um, a multifamily housing situation? It's a, it's an interesting condition to consider. But when you think about these single family on each floor and how one might be connecting these units uh, together. You might say, well, uh, just putting a, a stair core in the corner would be the most efficient way. But if we consider what it means if we were to take that stair and wrap it around that exterior, creating a, a poche of sorts and the spaces between those, once you've cleared the, the headroom for the stairs, allowing the the single room in the center being able to extend out and uh, create the the bathrooms the the beds and and uh, the kitchens that uh, expand that each of those floor plates out into the that edge so in this diagram of an unfolded poche perimeter highlights how uh, most of it uh, is not stair, it's actually the, the spaces of living, the bathrooms, the showers, uh, the laundry room and, uh, and a place to, to lounge. And, and another consideration of course is when you have a small footprint and when you're constructing in what, uh, what might require a very speedy manner and, and an economic manner, uh, how do you leverage the the, the CLT as a protagonist in, in, um, in construction. So if the exterior structure was all uh, done in CLT, being able to be erected in, uh, in a record amount of time in a couple of weeks, while the interior um, after the floor plates of CLT have been installed, be, can become, can be built uh, long after the exterior has been sealed up and giving you know, an extension of that construction time through, uh, through the winter. So one was, as you step up and through the building, looking at how these, uh, these poche spaces actually become that opportunity to, to project out, open up larger windows, one for each of the, uh, of the floor plates, giving each unit a, a unique connection back into the landscape. You know, this says in the poche that becomes uh, little bunk conditions, even opportunities to connect between that, uh, that common stair and, and those spaces. So as you see in gray, those are uh, paired up bathrooms and showers and, uh, and beds all along the perimeter, as well as a, as a kitchenette. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but I'm sort of floating it around. And so each unit turning around. And then we approach to the very top of the building, a, a potential common space for, uh, for the three units below or uh, a larger extension of the, that top floor. So 
the CLT can be um, uh, installed in, in only a few days, uh, one might be able to shift that construction time out of the summertime into, into uh, later in the year and allow these types of uh, constructions to be, to be done much more quickly and much more efficiently across uh, uh, different environments. When we look at um, the next project about a, a, considering a big box fit out, when these kinds of buildings are zoned, they sit in the sea of parking, along with other buildings of, of course, of that similar zoning, uh, a whole sea of nothing. In this case, uh, a Costco just north of Boston, outside the city, I used to go here all the time to get my toilet paper and, uh, and ribs. But it, we find that there's quite a you know, robustness to the existing structural grid, that it's able to sponsor uh, a, a condition that is quite um, robust for the small light industrial, uh, uh, light industrial uses, as well as smaller retail, as we begin to consider what it would mean if you rezoned the interior of a, of a Costco uh, to not be a big box store, but to be a, a city uh, in and of itself. So the, the alternating grid begins to suggest, well, what would happen if uh, at, that lower, at a lower level, an industrial uh, working zone that, uh, that is able to reinforce the, the spaces that are above uh, as housing. So imagine broad corridors uh, of in industrial uh, activity, whether it's fabrication or, uh, or distribution, uh, or even a small retail or, or dining, these become these, the elements that feed the housing that it is above. So in an alternate um, axis, a series of, uh, of uh, loft-like, uh, housing units become uh, directly connected to the spaces below, as well as a direct access to the roof, creating this uh, a new hybridized community that is, uh, uh, at one hand, internalized, but in, and also um, a production space that can that reaches out to the, the broader community. And also because of its low rise condition, um, combustible construction uh, in, in, the, um, in the guise of CLT is also is quite a, a protagonist in the speed of construction, the, the development of any one of these linear conditions um, independent from, from another one. So you know, Costco can become a place that uh, you know. Sometimes you go in there, you sit on the couch, and think, "Oh, I could, I could live here." But I mean, consider like, even you know, I know I'm speaking to a California audience right now, and sometimes you might feel like suburban sprawl is a, a something special to California, but. But we have that here in New England also. So now this is not even that far from that Costco we just looked at uh, outside of Boston, just a few miles north in Everett. The the uh, the urban suburban sprawl condition is you know actually quite similar to what you have in California. So we kind of are interested in what it means when you look at a house and its subsequent um, yard, side yard, front yard, and um, and what would it, what does it mean once we start to reconsider uh, if the the suburban condition were to be densified? What if we invert that space of the the yard from uh, the perimeter of each house to the interior of each house? So the the typology of a a courtyard house surrounded uh, at least by in three sides by one unit becomes the a unique potential for creating uh, a dense living condition. 
So as we know of the, the mat building, uh, quite popular in, in traditional housing in the Middle East, there's a, the, the importance of the courtyard of bringing light into a space uh, and air into a space, uh, being able to sustain um, living conditions while still deep within a wide footprint. Here in each of these units, and see here in red, always have a, uh, a three-sided courtyard that is privatized and is their own. And are able to, through the uh, intersection of two kind of level height spaces, be able to interlock another courtyard house that is stacked on top of it, uh, alternating and facing in opposite direction, uh, its own privatized courtyard as well. So really inverting that experience of, uh, of um, living in the, in the suburbs where you want your own house, your own privatized condition, your own privatized outdoor space into something that is uh, slightly, slightly more dense in between that um, line between suburban living and, uh, and urban living. And so that these units become threaded together by a common corridor uh, down the center of, uh, uh, of the link between these two units. And it's a little slow here, but uh, the, the upper unit being uh, having its own landscaped uh, green space that is, uh, is totally and wholly theirs without any neighbors with their um, the windows or bathrooms facing them. And that condition also becomes um, of that interlocking volumes becomes evident on the on the street edge where those spaces uh, are somewhat privileged uh, out and open to the street. The, the organization of these interlocking conditions also is um, uh, it, it's quite encouraging for a, a system such as um, cross laminated timber and its longer spans using the, uh, the timber in this case to turn on its side and become a beam um, rather than its standard condition of, uh, of a vertical wall or as a, as a floor slab. Uh, this, this last speculative project um, it considers the, the typology here in Boston of the, of the row house, typically uh, three to four stories tall, um, typically around 15 feet wide, so relatively narrow, so 15 to 20 feet wide, so relatively narrow, um, and limited uh, to um, its neighboring context of, uh, of the maximum height. Although we do find certain conditions where uh, extension uh, is possible, where uh, timber is still within its means to, to be constructed under a, high, a low rise condition. Here in this case, at least consider the, the biggest challenge becomes what, how is, how much circulation and, and the need for two means of egress eats into uh, you know, rentable space. Whether or not uh, one is able to bring together a scissor stair, uh, inter entwine stair, whatever you want to call it, um, to save uh, you know, a good 30% of uh, a floor area for, um, for circulation that, that is unusable. It becomes uh, an, an opportunity to reconsider the code and perhaps uh, look at what might be possible if this code could be stretched a bit. Look in, looking at this stair as not just uh, means of egress, but also crossing over to um, communicating stairs between multiple levels, uh, or multiple units. So in this case, if a, if a unit in a long skinny, um, bar buildings such as this uh, at the width of a, uh, a 
of a row house is it able to occupy one end with a long skinny edge and share that stair core uh, and be able to extend to um, a mezzanine level that opens out into a double height space next to it. This hybrid condition between what is a what is yours and what is common becomes um, you know, not only a question of uh, how one lives, but also a question of codes and how one might be able to find a way to uh, negotiate that code. Of course, that idea of, of a beam of CLT seems um, uh, almost to write itself in this, into this project here. So along that long linear edge where we we prized the end conditions opening out into the street, um, and and we are able to potentially bring in a, a long sliver of window uh, by using the CLT as a as a beam rather than a wall. And of course, we would be able to build this in a, a day and a half, right? Because of uh, how great CLT is that. I don't mean to be uh, to be a uh, uh, super fanboy, but I kind of am. So uh, of those four projects, those are all speculative and still on the boards. Although we are working hard to try to build at least the um, uh, the first project that I showed, we, when we were um, then invited to exhibit at the at the Biennale for 2020, um, we were wondering how can we uh, investigate and research this material further, find an opportunity to, um, to test what uh, a mass timber can, can actually do beyond its um, conventional condition of a, of a slab. So on the northern edge of the uh, Giardini de Virgini, um, on the northern side of the Arsenale in Venice, uh, a Vaporetto stop was kind of our, the site that was presented to us as, uh, as an opportunity to, to build a, a new gateway to the northern side of the, um, the Biennale. And, um, uh, and, and to provide a shelter and protection and, and an, uh, an idea, an identity to that side of, uh, um, of the, the compound. So the question was, well, now that CLT works very well and easily as a slab condition spanning across two uh, supports, where is the opportunity to and interpret that mass timber in into a cantilever, into the minimal uh, structural profile that it, that it needs in order to to stand um, to stand firm? So the, we were looking at what, well, what does it mean to begin to mill out what is unnecessary in uh, a slab of CLT as it spans. The, the center of it here represented in a diagonal across certain points becomes uh, quote unquote beam-like, um, limiting, removing the material on the perimeter uh, to lighten it up and be able to, to span and extend farther. You know, we, we got so far as to uh, break down the the project into its subsequent parts, examining the the limited number of uh, CLT slabs that we would be need to cut this thing out of. In this case, about a 16 and a half meter long slab. The largest ones that KLH in Austria uh, make became kind of our um, became kind of our material that we uh, that we used. So. Uh, I can switch on to an animation real quick. We, as you know, that CLT is uh, made up of layers of, of directional lumber, basically two by fours um, stretched in different directions, just the same way that uh, plywood is, is laid in different directions. And then as you begin to mill um, such a material in an oblique way, those layers begin to expose themselves um, as strata which is a quite an exciting um, figure and uh, image of CLT that you normally don't get. As you saw in at RISD, the ceiling is, you know, just looks like a, 
a bunch of wood stacked side by side, the end grain, which is what's interesting um, architecturally and formally about the material uh, is never exposed. So what is this, you know, we were hoping for an opportunity to, to play some games with, um, uh, with the figure. So that, you know, that being said, the amount of time it takes to mill CLT uh, at, at that scale was exorbitantly expensive and the scale of the, the project that we built, that we proposed was, uh, was too large even for, um, uh, even for the, the Biennale. So we, with the delay of the Biennale, even uh, uh, by a whole year, we were able to take a little bit of time to reconsider what it would, what it means to um, to exemplify what what the the material actually can do. And, you know, as we thought of turning that beam, or turning that slab sideways into a beam, finding a way of supporting it just just enough, just tenuously enough to uh, uh, to allow a, a massive cantilever as the new gateway. You know, with a with a new fulcrum and um, and tensile ties, this becomes uh, a different kind of icon than what we were considering initially. Where we, of course, we have to tie it back to um, tie it back to Venice. So uh, you know, the Lion of Venice and um, Saint Mark's uh, quote here, Pax TV, uh, Marche Evangelista Venus, is the becomes an opportunity to um, embed uh, other ways of uh, carving into CLT and, you know, and embedding another consideration of how uh, technology and the icon of technology here, in this case, uh, uh, dot matrix versus a um, chiseled and carved uh, uh, stone condition on your right hand side. Uh, ties back to history, but it also looks towards the 80s and maybe in the future. 80s being the dot matrix, I suppose. But in any case, we were just out there laying, uh, hanging this thing um, ever so tenuously. This crane here is actually sitting on a barge. This was our first attempt in, uh, in locating the, uh, this beam. Our second attempt actually was a crane borrowed from another uh, team on the site uh, that was st uh, standing on land. So when we speak about CNC and extreme tight tolerances, uh, sometimes it might be too much. In this case, uh, millimeters versus centimeters as the, um, as the installer was uh, lamenting, uh, just the, the slight undulation of the water um, in the uh, in the lagoon, didn't allow this green crane to be able to locate it in in the right spot. So, but ultimately we did get it on. It would, they did it so fast that I was on a different part of the site and it was done before I could even get there. But in any case, this the uh, the structure because you know a cantilever isn't just holding itself as a as its own weight. But it also is counteracting wind forces, it's counteracting um, uplift forces, sliding forces. These cables or ties begin to uh, tie it back to its base, and a, even a, a two-ton, actually three-ton stone sits on um, on one end to add as an anchor to uh, to the structure itself. So now here it sits uh, our second CLT project built um, on the other side of the world. And uh, hopefully somebody is actually able to come to Venice and experience it out on this site. Um, and so um, uh, I'm happy to say this is the end of the presentation portion. I'm really happy that, uh, that we were actually able to be out there and take pictures of this and share it with you guys. And I'm really looking forward to um, the discussion to follow. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Um, and I 
I always have questions, so I'll just uh, just jump right in. Um, I suppose I immediately realized after you were speaking that your title makes perfect sense, right? What would wood do? And then I remembered, of course, that your project um, has always been the rhetoric of materials or studying tectonics and really pushing the envelope of what that has always been and always could have been. And then said, oh yes, of course, CLT has been potentially the newest technological force um, to shift the way in which architecture, form, materiality, engineering can be happening over the next, let's say, 20, 40 years. I don't know, it's a whole new world. Very people know, most of us know very little about it, I have to be honest. Um, and it's been surprising to me that often CLT is used almost as if it was just a piece of steel or another piece of wood. And I guess where you're getting at with the Venice is you're really starting to push and that's a really interesting structure you put together. The cantilever seems contradictory somehow to the metal cable and tension. Uh, so it's really interesting to see how you, like, it's almost like an upside down king post. It's really fascinating that you're kind of pushing those conversations. I suppose the immediate thing I ask, because I just don't know enough, uh, when and when would you use CLT versus steel and wood? How does it hold up to exposure, fire, exterior being out there? Um, how does it function in terms of cost and code related to, of course, using steel and wood in combination? Um, you mentioned speed. Uh, what specifically makes it more, is it's not more readily available, it doesn't sound like it, but it's somehow faster in the way in which it functions. All these are very pragmatic questions, but if it's moving into a new industry that's, you know, if we could argue like a technological materialist that steel, glass, concrete created modernism in some ways, or at least had an impact on it. I think you're arguing something CLT is up to, and maybe you can help us to understand that. <laughs> a lot of questions. Um, I, I also welcome the dare to, to chime in, but I'm, um, you know, that is a lot of questions. And I, I do think- It's all that one I, question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, initially in our experience, uh, CLT was introduced as an um, analog to a concrete deck that has, you know, a precast concrete deck that has a, um, a, a speed of construction and an ease of installation um, and a prefabbed condition that allows it to, to have a very short um, installation time uh, and time on, on site. Um, but what, uh, but the cost of it uh, was higher than, than that material. And what, what it gained us in using CLT is a, you know, is more of a, a sustainability rhetoric and what, um, what it could do. And this, I'm speaking specifically about RISD, but, uh, but in general, CLT has been, been used as a you know, conventional condition, whether it's a bearing wall or uh, a slab. Um, and and very little beyond that, and th and I think that's what we were kind of interested in, you know, pushing the, the form of it, it as well as um, the application of it. I mean, this is an opportunity also to discuss the idea that um, the codes have possibly not caught up with the performance of the material itself. And so, whereas you have countries that are building with CLT in towers, um, the maximum height that we can build here is five stories. And so um, part of the reason for that is that, um, uh, as you asked before, I mean, Yes, you do need to cover it on the outside because it, it does not weather well exposed to the elements, but you can expose it on the interior. And if there were a fire 
the wood would char, but it would not fail. Uh, steel would, and uh, and steel would melt, and it it would uh, sort of yield to structural failure. So it has certain um, merits, uh, among others, being naturally renewable, and that it it is part of a cycle that renews itself. Uh, but the hybrid systems that you refer to are also interesting. I would, I would word the, I mean, my interest in the slab in Melbourne, unfortunately, you know, Melbourne was too far from the source of wood coming from New Zealand, that it didn't make, make sense. But if that had been in Denmark or it had, if it had been in Canada, the argument would have held that it's an interesting substitute for a concrete deck in the sense that if you're pouring a con concrete deck, you need formwork for it, let's say plywood, that you pour the concrete and then you throw away the plywood. The question that we posed was, what if we developed a, a formwork that becomes part of the structural performance of this piece in itself? And so by thickening that plywood into, into uh, CLT, you're actually functionalizing the formwork to become part of a composite deck. Um, in the same way, we tried to be purist at first at RIS, in RISD saying we should use LVLs in combination with CLT. But the, the depth of the LVLs became so, so deep that it didn't make sense anymore because you had to penetrate them in all sorts of places for the mechanical systems, the sprinkler systems and so forth. And so it turned out that the hybrid system uh, was even more logical in the sense that you get pre-drilled steel I-beams delivered to the site. You get the mechanical systems only running uh, in the corridor and sort of dead ending into the rooms through those holes, through those penetrations. And then the slab of the CLT no longer needs um, any jip board. So you get the warmth of the what is character beyond the rhetoric of ecology. It is part of the character of the space. But for that price, you're also getting an extra foot of ceiling. A different ceiling would, you know, have a lowered ceiling with with chipboard and so forth, and, you know, at eight feet. In this instance, uh, we got nine foot ceilings. So I, I also think of this as an opportunity, not to think of it through wood, but to think of it through more integrated systems and how this has a domino effect on. Uh, the mechanical, structural, and functional systems of the building at large. What's also kind of embedded in this is the assumption that we're all working in BIM. Because without a BIM model, in particularly for RISD, the coordination of all of those conditions, off-site, built, prefabbed, um, penetrations in steel, penetrations through CLT, being able to come together in, a, in an orchestrated uh, manner with with little to no um, adjustments on site is uh, is would only be able to be done through a highly coordinated um, BIM model, and so you know if it's if RISD looks relatively conventional that could have been drawn on um, drawn on vellum with pencils, uh, the coordination and the speed that it was built in could not have been done uh, on paper. Where, where is the speed coming from with CLT's manufacturing and production process and installation? Well, scale has a lot to do with it. So if you are pouring a slab or if you're aggregating blocks of some sort, there's just the manual labor, the industrial labor of amassing pieces. If you have a, a block that's eight feet wide by 50 feet long, that is your brick. Your brick is that much larger. And uh, in fact, RISD was so um, 
apprehensive about using it. They, they allotted two and a half, three months for the framing because they simply hadn't done it before. By the end of the first week, once they'd finished a deck and a half, they realized that this is gonna be done in two and a half weeks after that. And the whole framing was done in less than a month because they figured out a way to erect half the building while they were steel framing the other half and then putting the CLT here while the other steel was going up. And so it was laddering up the system uh, and it all, I mean, I, if I hadn't gone accidentally on one of those weeks, I would have missed the framing uh, of that entire building. Um, so yes, scale matters uh, and um, uh, offsite construction matters, prefabrication matters, and the idea that you have a kit of parts with a crane that fits into place uh, all impact its um, uh, the the speed with which it goes and the in a way the minimization of labor uh, as part of the equation. Well, part of it is not just minimizing labor, but almost eliminating certain trades. Whereas, you know, if you had a composite concrete deck, you would have to pour the floor in order to be um, to be able to operate on that floor. And you would have to wait 28 days in order for you to even access that, that slab. So a CLT slab, as soon as it's placed down, becomes a working surface. And that was able to, and that, that played a huge part in allowing us to consolidate as quickly. And, and also rather than having steel workers, uh, you have carpenters who install it, which is, um, which is also more affordable. One of the most beautiful things about the RISD construction site that I had not expected is that you would arrive there and it was almost a white glove project. They, there were two bins and, um, and all of the other light gauge framing had been sort of laser measured. And so the waste was minimized. You, you saw little shards of metal or things like that and it'd get thrown immediately in the bin. So you were walking uh, around on a sort of construction deck that was this silky, warm, smooth wood surface. There was no dust almost, there was no rust, there was no tatters, there was no markings of construction. It was just a pure clean site. And, uh, and I'm not suggesting that this happens naturally. No, this was part of the combination of the BIM environment and the possibility that a pre-measured construction site um, radically minimizes the waste and, and that these two bins that rolled around were just collecting all the junk all day. And so there wasn't this process of cleaning the site after a lot of detritus was thrown around everywhere. It was just always clean. Does that require a a different type of labor staff? Well, we had a, a very, very good management um, in the Shamit construction on, on that site. They've had a, a long track record with those teams that they were working with. So it's a, it, is a, it is a relationship thing. It's a, it is an experience thing. And it, it's, a, it's a type of project that you, because this is also based on another type of uh, uh, a relationship called IDP, where the builders and the designers and the owner all come together as co-owners of the project. Basically, we've put our <clears throat> our profit margin on the line, um, and we work together from the very, very beginning uh, with the builder as well as all of their sub subcontractors, so that they know. The building inside and out as we're designing it. So you, so that leads to the the, the things that Nader was speaking about about the cleanliness of the site also meant the cleanliness of our drawings and the cleanliness of the the knowledge that these uh, that these builders are are um, applying because they've been all through the building already before even stepping foot onto the site. Uh, maybe just before I open up to more questions, I, uh, can I ask you a question about form? So I kind of hinted at it that um, 
CLT has often in its, you know, it's very new material is being used somewhat similarly to other materials within the building process or method. Do you foresee now that you're starting to engage in it uh, creatively that it could have a real impact on form, on figure, on what's plausible in construction and design? Maybe this is a good moment to acknowledge uh, Mendez da Rocha, uh, whose recent passing, uh, you know, brings a moment of pause because uh, the way that he conceptualized uh, structure was always, almost always at a different scale than what was uh, readily available to one's imagination. Uh, the, it was always the colossal, the monumental, the out of scale. And I think the idea that you get a raw material that is that comes at this extraordinary scale uh, Im imagines that you start thinking in irrational ways about possibilities. So uh, maybe Arthur, if I can get you to go to the slab building in the South End, you know the argument that I would build around that is just imagine what does it mean to be able to build a tall tower out of 28 beams. That's all there is. How, how long can it take to make 28 beams? And what's the economy with which you can make a tower like that with just you know 28 erections? And so for me, the elegance of that is that the identity, the figure of the facade uh, is the has to do with the excavation of that one beam into ribbon windows whose spans uh, are the you know uh, are an expression essentially of the performance of that structure so here the rhetoric of the building its language uh, works in tandem with um, uh, an innate and latent quality of this structural system um, and, and so I think this is maybe from my, from my taste, this one is the most sophisticated of the other, uh, uh, of the other buildings that we've presented today, because, you know, like the big box is just what it is. The, uh, the Mac building has more to do with the, you know, the argument about the setbacks and all of that. We didn't develop it tectonically, but if we had this one maybe captures a dimension of of the the sophistication that can come out uh, that is born out of the radical scale of the beam in contrast with the let's say the scale of cladding and the more intricate systems that break down uh, windows and you know other intermediary scale systems like stairs and and other things. Could you see this being? developed in a hybrid manner with 3D printing and that innovation with maybe more with concrete, but also a way in which something can be produced with a different kind of monolithic quality and scale. Strange question. You're, you're, I think 3D printing opens up a whole new other dimension because, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's something that we haven't done much of, but it, it, it challenges the, the notion of the module entirely. It, it challenges notions of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the expansion um, and contraction of materials if it's monolithic. Uh, it if, if it's done in a sophisticated manner, it, one could imagine ways in which uh, in a monolithic block as it's printing itself out that it, it can insert and distinguish between that which is waterproofing or, or that which is a vapor barrier or that which is an interior finish. In other words, the resolution of its 
print out changes um, uh, almost like the density of a bone. If you, if you did a cross section through a bone, you'd understand that it, the, the density of, of its molecular makeup varies even though it looks mon monolithic. I think that's uh, an equally interesting uh, system, though fundamentally different than what we're working on here. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I don't really wanna change the conversation, but I had some other conversation questions I wanted to pose. Uh, one, I kind of want to talk about your representation, if you're willing to chat about it. Um, it. There is a consistency of development and style. Uh, I don't know, I was trying to understand it. You know, there's a characterization, a use of black, beige, um, a particular type of line work, your use of green, um, maybe an abstraction. I also noticed you shade uh, almost contradictorily by shading out corners of all spaces. Like you actually draw the lines and shade the lines. I'm wondering how you developed this kind of um, material language in your drawings. How, why you may be posing, if there's like meaning behind it that you're implying, who you found that inspired you along that journey. Um, you know, representation is really important. So I just, uh, and you clearly have a, it seems to me there's a slight agenda in it. I mean, yeah. I, I think the problem of representation at large beyond this particular presentation has loomed large. And, and I think that there are projects in which, you know, people use perspective almost as a, convention to show illusory space. Uh, and instead we have used uh, anamorphosis to undermine the naturalization of perspective, for instance. So if there was a, uh, an argument to be made about our representations in general uh, is that we almost always can um, uh, appeal to conventions uh, but then overturn them or undermine them or challenge them in one way or another. Uh, I would say if there's something that uh, we've tried to do in this case, and I, I haven't certainly thought it through in a more sophisticated way, maybe Arthur can speak to this, but we had the challenge of developing four projects as diagrams, but making sure that the diagrams are actually that maintain a fidelity to the tectonic resolution of systems that are highly specific. So, and, and these are, that's a contradiction in terms and how can you be diagrammatic and absolutely specific about a wall section all at the same time. But, but part of this had to do with also, you know, the abstraction of being able to refer to, you know, the po poche of a wall. So if you notice our pochets are black, but in fact, there's a lot of white line work in them to show the systems. If Arthur, if you can zoom into the section, there's an incredible amount of detail in there that, that shows with incredible faithfulness the way that it's made up. But at the same time, the, the toilet zones and the stair zones are also within that poche. So, so we have to develop a way to show um, Poche is an abstract system also, not just as a literal system of uh, what you're cutting through. Yeah, those are beautiful. Yeah, there's n n none of these drawings are ever strictly section as conventional section. They're always falling somewhere on the line between a diagram and a representation of, uh, of reality. There's always that layer that uh, we can't communicate without extending beyond um, those those things, such as a, as you mentioned the the grayness in that space. If we a conventional drawing would not have grayed out those uh, those pushade spaces, rather they would all read the same. In this case, this is about this drawing specifically is about the uh, the path around and the uh, the common space 
do you, does your office obviously spend a lot of time on this to, I'm kind of curious how you even manage. Um, I mean, I can't, I, I'm assuming you, you two don't sit there drawing all day long because you can't, <laughs> you have a massive team that helps you. How do you, how do you structure that? I mean, this is, is this, this isn't really even paid for probably by your clients. This is something you're doing. You know? We should credit Alex Vilku who worked day in and day out on this. There, there isn't a vast team on this. He did have some help, but uh, the lion's share of this work uh, needs to be credited to his uh, incredible uh, hours and dedication that he put into this. But equally so, you know, it just is, it's also about the precision of how you develop a set of questions around which you revolve systems and then sort of deploy them. So it's, um, yes, you're, you're right. But at the same time, no, there isn't a huge team on this. What's well, yeah, a huge team in the office, but yes, go on. What's funny is that when you mentioned earlier about the um, drawing convention that we've had and or that, that you read is that we often find ourselves re, reinvestigating, re, you know, trying to find a new way of, of representation or being dissatisfied with what, how we've done it before in the past. And so that being said, this drawing had gone through, I don't know, at least 20 different versions of it, not air between a white section, uh, you know, white pochet versus dark pochet versus rendered versus patched. So it is a, it's, it's often still a moving target. I just, I just wanted to draw attention to it because it's clearly well-crafted and something we all can learn from um, as much as the buildings themselves. I, Gabriel is sitting there with a question. Go for it. Thank you guys for uh, giving the, the lecture. It's really interesting to see. Um, on, on the note of digital fabrication, uh, you just mentioned earlier about 3D printing has this infinite possibility of monolithic form and there's this ability to CNC almost anything. So how does your firm set those material limits or the use CLT to inform the design now that it has all these new possibilities? What, what limits or what qualities of uh, super flexible, strong material do you, do you use or capitalize on for your design? Like, would you see a, maybe like a rebirth of balloon framing where these are used as sheer walls on the outside of homes again, or things along that nature? I'll let Arthur respond to your question, but I, I'm gonna say one thing that we probably didn't articulate. This house, uh, we argue as a CLT house, but actually it wouldn't work if it weren't a combination of of CLT and stud framing. The inside wall has to be stud framing precisely because that's what uh, houses all of the electrical, mechanical, and ducting systems. Uh, the axonometric that you have here shows how the, the, the yellow and the red are codependent uh, within which the stair is encased. So most everything we've presented tonight are hybrid systems, not by default, but by rule. Uh, but both you and Stephen have made an appeal towards the 3D printed artifact. And, and I would have to say that's something we actually haven't really done. I mean, we, we not in a, not at the building scale anyway. And that would change the, you would ask new questions about the potential of materials uh, if you were doing that. And I think there are people out there doing that right now. We're not one of them, uh, but that's not because we wouldn't want to. It's, it's simply like a medium that we haven't engaged uh, with in, with that level of intimacy. But it's a very uh, important question I think that you're asking. And in my world, the idea that uh, a printout 
can intelligently use resources through the deployment of different densities uh, and different material constitutions within one nozzle is suggestive that it's already thinking of how a skin operates on the outside versus on the inside. And so um, I like that as a possibility. I don't know, Arthur, what do you think? I mean, honestly, that's the first, this is the first time I've, I've heard uh, this kind of discussion about 3D printing as you know, the potential of multiple outputs from the same nozzle or potentially multiple um, uh, materials uh, being printed out at the same time, which I find fascinating. But maybe what I find even more fascinating is when a 3D printing condition is actually brought out into field with all the things that we've been talking about in terms of the efficiencies of CLT and, uh, and construction is that they're prefabricated in highly controlled conditions and they, they have a highly accurate um, uh, prefabricated uh, dimensions. Whereas in an infield condition, print 3D printing at, at mass building scale introduces a whole other way of of understanding the site and controlling, you know, geometry across a larger scale. That, um, you know, I think this technology still far beyond, but but could be quite fascinating. Uh, so I wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, I was going to follow up. Um, so the use of CLT on this project specifically is what drove you to use that hybrid system that you're pointing out within the yellow. Because that, that wouldn't have been necessary, wouldn't have been uh, pragmatic if it wasn't for the CLT that you started with. And well, then in a form, like an informed material design decision that resulted because of it. One, one um, might have said, well, the interior um, stud framing is also CLT, but it doesn't have the, um, uh, the void qualities of a, of a framing system that allows your duct runs and your plumbing and your electrical to run through. So it is highlighting specifically the inherent challenges of, uh, of mass timber, um, you know, embedding elements and, uh, and you know, creating another level of flexibility on field, in field flexibility that um, that is a challenge. And similarly to cast in place concrete, you know, we all know how difficult it is to coordinate lighting and plumbing and sprinklers and cast in place that you, um, if, if you have a budget, you end up with exposed systems. And so in this case, we leverage the CLT's speed in terms of using it as a bearing wall construction as a balloon frame. Uh, as an analogy for the exterior, being able to erect it very quickly, and then the reinforcing of and supporting of the floors on the interior being done with through the um, jointly through the balloon framing or the the stud framing on the inside. And the idea that one can make infield construction more efficient, get closed up and weatherproof faster. Is is always a challenge uh, whenever you're you're building. You're always fighting the weather. So this was a way of thinking of leveraging what what CLT is good at. In this case, um, build something little and out in the middle of nowhere. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Bob Ladd. Bob, you can actually, I believe, turn on your sound and speak. Are you here? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry, I can't help thinking about fires with these wood structures. And I was wondering, and even the ventilation, did you have any special considerations there for like on the, the big box fit out uh, between the residential and the light industrial below? And even on this uh, one that you're showing right now, the rural project four stories, ventilation and, and fire codes. How did you make it work? Uh, you're really challenging us for on a 
I'm a very, very highly speculative project here. <laughs> oh. um, but you know, to, to use an example, uh, at RISD, the construction of a floor slab, um, as poetic as it may be, being a, a simple slab of CLT, the separation, fire separation between the floor levels, because it's a residential, a, a residence building, you have to have uh, fire separation. You also have to have noise separation. And you look at CLT, you think it's um, really dense and heavy wood, but it's not nearly as dense and heavy and, and soundproof as concrete. So we actually ended up having to do several layers of, of noise uh, proofing on top of the CLT, letting the ceilings be exposed and, and but protecting the floors. So you actually end up with three more inches of, of material between uh, the CLT floor slab and your foot. So in, in, in that case, and in the consideration of any of these other systems, there are opportunities, where, particularly if there, there is no fire separation required that you can leave it bare and you know, walk on, uh, on nature per se, <laughs> or you have to um, uh, find other engineered solutions, hybrid conditions of, of layering um, of the floor. So that being said, the kind of cross condition here in this in this um, uh, proposal allows you know, vent stacks and vent ventilation between the residential um, uh, linear bars and potentially uh, uh, side ventilations, whereas most of the, the, the industrial conditions are on the edge. Um, I suppose just to go back and then to have a more question. Um, the reason I even brought up 3D printing because I never really saw anything uh, specifically accomplished in that effort of trying to print a building. So I used to almost laugh of it. But lately I've been seeing some really interesting provocations that are really beginning to use it. And so I only brought it up to you because it seems that in your hands um, and your sensibilities as you drive CLT forward, that seems like another, I don't know, tool in the kit to change the fields in the same way that you mentioned size, scale, efficiency, speed, but also monolithic qualities, uh, taking away, you know, reducing labor, it just seemed really impressive to me that that is in your, in your venue of, you're gonna look at it in a way that people aren't gonna look at it. And I think you probably come up with something pretty spectacular. I guess my last question though, um, it's a kind of a career question because we have a lot of students and it's sometimes hard to know how to maneuver in this field uh, in order to one, achieve and survive, but also get to do the things you love to do, which I would say both of you have really accomplished. And I think you came from it in such different directions in some ways, but are in the same company together. And, you know, Arthur, you represent in some ways what a lot of our students uh, aim to achieve. Um, joining a company, working really hard, having clear skill and talent that gets seen and being able to arrive at the end, I would obviously say due to the respect and support of uh, the principal who created that world as well. But that world's also very hard to have, you know, for Nader that what you achieved is, I mean, it's very small people, but it's very small that people get to do that much, you know, very few people achieve and I'm not just saying that because I'm trying to say something. I'm just from being around and being alive and watching what's happened over the last 30 years to the people I've known chasing after that dream. Uh, it's so hard to, so few make it. I mean, from your perspectives at this point, how do you, what do you say to young people trying, you know? Find the right horse. 
It's your wagon too. I don't know. <laughs> One round. I mean, there have obviously been struggles. I mean, I met you guys back in 2008. We're still that. struggling. Well, we're still struggling. I, you know, sometimes people look at a body of work and they say, oh, uh, you know, they've got it all together or something like that. But the, the reality is that we have had a pretty consistent track record of financial challenges all along. Um, people uh, work very, very hard. And so uh, I think we have a long way to go to, to, to qualify as a, as a collaboration that involves a, a comfortable workload. Um, so in, in a strange way, even though we've developed together uh, with Arthur and a handful of others, a pretty significant collaboration, you know, there's, there's a whole team of us now that we've been there over 10, 15 years. So, um, you know, I, I would say that all of them play a very critical leadership role. Everybody has slightly different areas of talent and uh, focus, but um, I think it's a difficult business and I would hear divide the business from the other stuff that we love doing, which has to do with disciplinary advancement or a, a particular focus that, you know, we might bring to a project that somebody else may not be interested in. Um, and part of that has to do with uh, sticking to your guns and insisting on maintaining the narrative that holds the body of work together at the same time that you're doing a single project. But also patience, you know, the patience that it takes, you know, for every drawing that you see here, there's 20 that have been thrown out. Uh, or schemes for that matter. So I, I really do think that uh, sometimes that these things that don't apparently have a client or a goal, uh, eventually if you do the right scheme, the right client ap appears for that out of the woodwork. No pun intended. Great. Um, uh, unless there's another question out there in the gang. Just want to thank you both for your time this evening or for us this afternoon. And uh, we really very much appreciate it. And congratulations on all the, uh, what you do and what you've uh, accomplished, drawings and materials. I mean, they, they produced so many more buildings they didn't show today. But as uh, Nader pointed out, there's lots of video out there. Um, hopefully this is a, a different kind. So thank you, Arthur, for setting the tone of the conversation, appreciate it. Um, it's, our, it's really been our pleasure. Um, this is the first time we've shared these drawings. So great. even though we, we haven't seen all the other stuff that we've done that's built, this is, uh, you, you guys uh, have gotten a treat. So, thank you, <laughs> really, thank you, it was great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Arthur. That was great. Oh, thank, thank you, guys. Much appreciated. All right. Miss California. Appreciate it too. Yeah. Well, we like it here. So come back. <laughs> Visit. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a great night.